In 1991, I decided that if I do buildings exactly like the way Laurie Baker does, then I'll be a follower of Laurie Baker. So I decided to deviate from Laurie Baker very consciously. One is that I brought in vernacular architecture into my designs very, very consciously. Then the second point which I tried to take was recycled materials. And the third thing is to conservation of buildings. The fourth aspect is use as much timber as possible in the buildings, which you can see in my buildings. The word sustainable architecture was never used in the 70s or 80s. It only in the late 1980s people started using the word sustainable development. Even the word environment came in the 70s or late 60s. Now this photograph is that of Silent Valley. The first time I'm listening to something about conserving the natural environment is in relation with Silent Valley. When I was studying in school, the Silent Valley controversy was going on. There were various meetings held in Rwandrum. At that time, I was very much active participant of some of the meetings organized by the Science Society in Rwandrum. They used to hold classes on various topics. And uh, Tano Palpanaban, who recently passed away, he was one of the serious people working with it. There is one Dr. Suresh Kumar who became a, who's a famous pediatric uh, cardiologist. He was also the secretary of the Science Society. They used to do cures and, and in connection with one of the talks, Dr. Sadish Chandran Nair, who was the famous environmentalist, he came and talked about Silent Valley. That was the first my exposure to the conservation of the natural environment. The next, my kind of thing what I read was in the late 1970s. Mathura is only about 60 kilometers from Taj Mahal. There was a huge controversy saying that the pollution of the Madhura refinery will affect Taj Mahal. In one of those years, Indian Historical Congress passed a resolution saying that this should be re-looked at. Indira Gandhi laid the foundation. It was one of the major refineries coming up in the that part of India. But in spite of all the oppositions, I did not see much hue and cry from any of the engineers or architects. It was mainly from the historians and the Indian History Congress passed the resolution. And now, very recently, Madhura Refinery is going for an expansion plan and there is again the controversy has come up and the government has appointed an expert committee and the committee is looking into, into this issue. In the early 1970s, that's the time when we started talking about energy crisis. The first UN Global Conference on the Human Environment was held in Stockholm in 1972. This is the first UN Global Conference on the Environment. And our Prime Minister, at that time Indira Gandhi, went to the conference and made a strong attack on all the developed countries. And what she said, poverty is the greatest polluter. Because in 1970s, the issue of pollution was very, very important. Most of the cities were highly polluted, even now. And in the 1970s, nobody thought that the forest is to be protected or conserved for the future generations. And this was considered to be the norm in those, those days. In the 1960s, I think the year was 1962, Rachel Carson wrote the book called The Silent Spring, in which she brought the attention of the world, saying that the world is not going to be very livable, pollution is on the rise, pesticides are on the rise, and we are going to face the consequences. This is a book written in 1962, was raised the awareness among a lot of people. In 1972, the book, I mean, the Club of Rome, brings out the book. It is a study done by mostly the Harvard scientists, 
1972, the title is called Limits to Growth. And they said there is a limit to growth. All the oil reserves will finish it in a period of time. There is a limit to iron ore, there is a limit to aluminium. We cannot grow the way we are just going. So this is the book which came in 1972. So as a student, I have been exposed to some of these things, some of these thought processes. Even we have studied in the about pollution and the effects of pollution. And that's the way when I pass out in 1984. I took the civil engineering degree, but I did not know what to do next. That's the time when I met Laurie Baker, when I was doing my finally a project, which normally was done by a group of students. I did it independently as part of the, my, my study and my thesis was how to treat the human waste or the household waste. How can you treat it and use it as a biogas plant? So that was my study. M. M. Professor M. M. Thomas was my date. We set up a pilot plant and to do a study of the biogas plants which are existent in the city, I was just going somewhere near Batyu Kava, went to one of the house, saw Laurie Baker working next door. I discussed with him for about a one hour. We had a long discussion on various aspects, including biogas plants and treatment of waste and all those things. I just talked to Laurie Baker. I did not know what I will be doing next. So I asked him, can I come and work with you? And he said, I do low cost houses or cost effective. I don't have much money. I collect very little money from the client. So I might not be able to pay you much. This thing I said, I'm not looking at payment. I'm interested in learning what you are doing. Laurie Baker told me that he is being opposed by most of the people, all the conventional engineers. Architects were against the kind of architecture he is doing. So it was not like, uh, it, was, it, was, it was always an alternate stream at that point of time. So when we now look back, what is the relevance of Lori Baker? One of the great relevance of Lori Baker is that he did expose work. It was not being practiced much. Of course, there were some buildings in Uti, for example, the Lawrence School is exposed brickwork and people said these buildings will not last for 2 years, 5 years, 10 years, 25 years but now 50 years are past buildings are still standing. And this is a building with so much jali work so much, and at the same time Lord bearing and it's a 3 story structure and what you see the brickwork is a 4 and a half inch brickwork. The building is still standing. He used arches instead of concrete lintels. He used extensive use of jalis. He used filler slabs. He was the only architect or engineer who was using filler slab when I started working with him. There was nobody else using filler slab. Now there are plenty of architects and engineers doing it. And when I used to work with him, we used to use lime as a building material for mortar. We used to use soap pea. So all those things. So I could while working with him, I could experience and learn all those things about materials, how he is doing interaction. I, I will say that I did not study much civil engineering when I was a civil engineering student. I have no problem in admitting it. But I learned more in practice and this is what happens with most of the people. I am not saying theory is unimportant or any of those things, but this is what has happened. And this is also one of the buildings. This building is no longer there. It has been demolished, not because structurally became unsound. The building was demolished because one of the, a big flat has come behind and the children of the Namudri who used to originally became the client of Laurie Baker sold it to the builder. Baker was highly questioned. This is one, one time, one of the posters when Baker was asked to do the state planning board building at in the uh, 1990s, the employees of the state uh, planning board went on strike and you can see the poster what they have written. That was the situation even in 1990. I was very lucky to work with Laurie Baker. I, I am the fourth person to work with Laurie Baker. I worked with Laurie Baker for about nine months. So not a great experience or when I left Laurie Baker, I never thought I'll be able to design buildings or any of those things. 
But my interest in architecture went up drastically. I started reading various books. And one of the books I read was Architecture for the Poor by Hassan Fahey. It was available in one of the libraries in Trivandrum. Another book was the workbook of an unsuccessful architect. I, what I used to do, Baker will come to the site, I will ask him questions, I will write down the questions and I will be ready with 5 questions or 10 questions every day. Whatever doubt. And evening I will go and read about architecture. Then I left Laurie Baker because he was paying me, I did not know, any, I did not have any work to do, very little. I did during those 9 months. I learned from him. So after that, I became a little bit kind of guilty and left. And when he came out, there was a big demand for Laurie Baker buildings even in those days. Because Laurie Baker has been practicing in Toronto from 1970s onwards. There was nobody doing Laurie Baker buildings. So people asked me, can you do a Laurie Baker building for us? Because everybody, Laurie Baker might not be very approachable kind of thing. And that is when... I started doing buildings. This is the first building which I did on the river side for a professor couple. Both of them were professors in CMS College, Kotem. 1985, I designed this house. Completed in 1986, second half. I did not only this building, I did so many projects. Because people like these kind of buildings. I never had to look back, I will say, since 1985. Because there was a demand for these kind of buildings. Of course, I did not know how to draft. I used to use the micro tip. There was a pile at 5 rupees was the price because I used to buy a few of them. I used to draw using micro tipping on a butter sheet or on a graph sheet. I did not touch the rotring pen at all. I did not know how to use the rotring pen. And my earlier designs, I will draw it and I will take it to Laurie Baker and show him the designs and tell him these So all my earlier buildings were read by Laurie Baker. For, because for me, he was the guru. He was everything. I just took it as a mission to do these buildings. How did I come to this stage? I think there are three, four things. In 1991, I decided that if I do buildings exactly like the way Laurie Baker does, then I'll be a follower of Laurie Baker. So I decided to deviate from Laurie Baker very consciously. Now, where did that deviation go? One is that I brought in vernacular architecture into my designs very, very consciously. So vernacular architecture means architecture without architects. The kind of buildings you see in our villages and towns where there is no architect is credited with designing such buildings. That is something which I wanted to take elements from it. It's the knowledge system which is something which has been passed on from generation to generation. Then the second point which I tried to take was recycled materials. I started using recycled materials in the early 90s. And the third thing is to conservation of buildings. Our building should not be demolished, try to conserve us. Even now, 50% of our properties is involving conservation of buildings. The fourth aspect is use as much timber as possible in the buildings, which you can see in my buildings. So, because timber is the most sustainable building material. I will try to explain these points, vernacular architecture. I mean, Palmanaburam Palace is one of the best examples of vernacular architecture. The roof is prominent, the courtyards are there. The verandas are there. You see the timber walls. This building is at least 200, more than 200 years old. In front of the Padmanabha Swami temple with the timber walls still standing without much of a problem. And in 2001, this is a project which I got where I tried to use vernacular architecture. Quite a bit of the Tamil architecture thing. I mean, you can see this is a small shrine. I mean, I use recycled columns. In fact, this entire timber roof is built with recycled things. Even the thin eye is recycled, the doors are recycled. I try to bring in elements of the niches and all those things which were in Tamil Nadu architecture. This is 20 years ago. I used Atamudi tiles for this project. These windows are recycled and 
So it's more of a recycled material, vernacular architecture, using local crafts, local materials. Here what you find is the Namada Panambana you see the, the mat which is uh, there in the I went to Podamangalam and bought these uh, mats which we use to dry paddy and various things. And Anantya Resort is one project which you might be aware because closer to Tuvantrum. I did not copy the vernacular architecture the way exactly it is. I tried to look at it in a different way, a new interpretation, not blindly copy. There is nothing sacred when an architect or engineer blindly copies the vernacular. Villagers are doing it every day. So what is so great about an architect doing it is what is to be done. So the Anandya Resort I have used. Also, the entire tile is recycled tiles. And they are not newly made for the resort. They are from buildings demolished. I mean, this is an office which I have done in Chennai city where we have reused the tiles. The lower doors, they are all recycled doors. This is the office building with the veranda. So there is a lot of these elements. This is the residence of Tishani Doshi. She is a famous writer. The main door is recycled. The windows are recycled. I use bringing back the cement flooring. This is a beach house for them. And this is Dekshina Chitra, where also I used extensive recycled materials. Of course, the concrete roof is used. Bringing in elements of the courtyards and stone columns and all those things. So you can see extensive use of the recycled materials. So this is where I try to stand out from Laurie Baker. One is high usage of uh, vernacular architecture. The second is the recycled materials. I try to use recycled materials in the most of the, my project and conservation of the built heritage. I mean, this is an old uh, house which has been converted into a boutique hotel. They charge 5,500 or 6,500 rupees for it, the typical courtyard. Otherwise, this building would have been demolished. I asked the owner, he said it brings in revenue for him. This is another courtyard as part of this. And one of the major projects I got involved was in Nusiris Heritage Project. I was not interested, I never used to do government projects, I was reluctant, but there was a pressure from the government that uh, they want me to do. But it's good that I took up the project because there were certain projects which you will not be able to take it in a private practice because the scale is very different. See, when you do conservation, you are conserving the whole building. You are reusing the whole building. You are recycling the whole building. It is very, very eco-friendly. It is the greenest thing what can, one can do. Because the building has already made its impact on the environment. Uh, conserving a building is at least five times greener than the most platinum nature building. It's most of the conservation processes are now more labor intensive. I mean, there is a, there is a way that you do conservation. And conserving our buildings, we can make the impact on the environment much lesser. I use extensive use of timber in my buildings, this building, except that white wall that you see, which is only on one side. The entire building is on timber, fact, glass and timber, because this is on a hill station. That's why I, I normally I don't add much glass. With very minimal use of the concrete and timber has been made. Even the floor is timber, the ceiling is timber. The, I mean, this is the main living room hall. The roof is also with timber and timber plants. And this is a restaurant I've done in Wandi Periyar in one of the resorts. I mean, if there is four sides, three and a half sides is fully timber and glass. Because again, Wandi Periyar is in a hill station area. So this area I had to do masonry because the kitchen is coming on one side. On the other side, the toilets are coming. The wash area of the restaurant is coming. That's why I just gave the some area, which is three and a half cent. Otherwise, it's fully rusting on timber. Not even uh, much use of much use of concrete in this. One of the problems I find to do is to get proper structural engineers to do the timber rooms. I always outsource my structural engineering uh, to. Uh, specialist is what I do. The other important aspect, so Tim, see that one advantage of the timber in a sustainable building material, when you use more and more timber, the carbon inside the timber is not allowed to escape as carbon dioxide or methane. Because trees are something which can absorb carbon dioxide and store in the timber. If the timber is allowed to decay, carbon dioxide is emitted. If timber is 
use the fiber to carbon dioxide is emitted. So if we try to make you make good use of timber in buildings, it is locking the carbon and trees is always renewable building material. Trees can be grown again. I am again cutting forest to use timber. I try to use of all timber species, various timber species are used. I have written a book on timber structures. So it is not teak and jackwood and uh, rosewood. I mean there are so many other timber species which can be very much, very much used for the uh, in, in buildings. And if you use more and more buildings, that will lead to uh, better in terms of the global warming. I try to bring the humanism in architecture. I try to consider the users of the people very strongly. And uh, uh, they are very, very important. Because social sustainability is also very important in sustainable architecture. Cultural sustainability is also very important. And this is uh, the Institute of Palliative Medicine I've done in Calicut Medical College campus, including the guest house and patient's treatment and staff quarters and teaching institutions. So I have so many courtyards in it. And uh, Jali, I they did not have much of a budget for this. So I use extensive of terracotta Jalis. Hospital means people have a kind of image that it should be always white and tiles and all those things. We try to limit the use of this. And this is one of the patients. And when I was doing one of the rounds and I asked him, because these are meant for the palliative care patients. So they might spend only the last two weeks in, of their life in this hospital. So, so ask this patient, how do you feel in this place? He doesn't know who I am. This is a government hospital. Nobody is paying any money or any, any other things for getting admitted. He said that once I came to this place, half of my illness is gone. Because in this bed, he can look out through a window. He can see the birds. He can see when it is raining. He can see the trees, which is absent in our government hospitals. You can, you are in a government medical college in a paywall. This is not a paywall. This is the, the, the lowest category of the patient. We, we have only two categories of beds in that institute. Everybody has this cluster because I thought it is inhuman to have patients lined out in a, like in a government medical college ward. And I think it's inhuman for the patient to look at the ceiling and wait for the treatment and spend his last few days. I would, I would have loved to give a French show but because of the cost restriction we gave only. I mean, there are two windows. for One bed is for the relative, one bed is for the patient. But each can look out through a window. The planning was done in such a way and that might be the reason why he said that. And the hospital was inaugurated by a patient. And the hospital people were also kind enough to put my name uh, engraved in the stone. So as you know, if you go to the palliative institute, Right in the front, you will see that my name is done. Similarly, another project which I did is for the tsunami victims. So I did, I've done worked on many disasters. I worked on the Manorama village in Lato earthquake, Manorama collected money for the Puj earthquake as well. That village also I designed. And I was asked to design when the tsunami came. I'm, I'm based out of Chennai now. So the two projects I took over. One is Trankovar, which is a Danish settlement, 1,500 houses. Another one is Chinnagudi, where 500 houses. So I have done two, three projects earlier. So I said that I will do customize each house. So I said to my team and to the villagers, 1,500 houses, 1,500 designs. I just thought, why can't we build a house which doesn't look the similar? It was not very easy. So we customized each plan. We made a plan how the house will be expanded as well. So we just tried to look at that point. What you could see if the house is to be customized, the law. It's a public project, 1,500 houses. Many people want me, you will not be able to start the construction because the village is fishermen, very difficult community to deal with, very homogeneous. But when the start of the construction, we could see people coming in large numbers and doing puja for their houses which was a, I mean, which means the ownership of that, uh, the house started there. We made it gender equality. So we said that Velu, 
Muthu Lakshmi, both are names. Husband, the house will be given to both husband and the wife. We could see so much participation as part of the construction. When they try to put the friend, I mean, when you put the friend door, you do a puja. They also did it, although it's a public building. And they are not spending money on So all these changes we could see. They supervised that. They did the curing because it's their house. We told them if you don't do the curing properly, the strength will not achieve. Don't expect the contractors to do the curing. So the people the came forward to do that. I mean, we said them, you can choose the colors, you can choose the setbacks, and there were changes which in it. And I mean, 1,500 houses is not a small number to do. And we did the houses. I visited this place 10 years later, and this is what I saw. I mean, this is what I saw when the project was inaugurated. And this is what I saw 10 years later. Pumped walls came up, roads came up. Some people who had money built solid concrete walls. You can see the houses inside. And you can see somebody combined two houses. Somebody extended the houses. This is another two houses. They extended with completely changed because it is their house. Some houses were transformed like that. It's the ownership feeling is created. And I just quote this. There were two books which came out of this project. And uh, one of the German architect who interviewed, I'm just quote taking it from her book. We were lucky that this architect worked on our project. Many things are well done. However, there are some things that could have been done much better. For example, the orientation of the bathroom and toilet. They should not face the neighbor's house. We had to build compound walls. And then there is the quality of construction, which is in some cases poor. Better, of course, than in many other villages that we saw. However, not always satisfying. Who I would like to build my house with? I will call this architect again. If you'd like to plan a small, single small house, I would tell him about the toilet and the quality. But I think he goes for brick projects in cities only. So I would call the mason. See, the architecture has to change the life of the people. Design has to change the life of the people. It is for the people and that is what is there. So this is the kind of things where I try to build a dimension into my architecture. Now, what is it? Where should we go in terms of sustainable architecture? I have a different take on it. I'm not into this green buildings and sustainable buildings and lead rating or any of these things. I have my own reasons for it. Technology failure is something which has happened. We always think technology will find a solution. It's never correct. Just like medicines, modern medicine has side effects, technology has also side effects. In the 1920s, early 20th century, we started doing air conditioning. I mean, uh, we started making fridges and various the gas which was used was chlorofluorocarbons, CFCs it is called. Decades later, it might be in the 1980s, we found out that the gas which is used for air conditioning is depleting the ozone layer, which means the ozone layer is what controls the ultraviolet radiation into the Earth's surface. So the radiation is becoming more, which means could be one of the reasons for the global warming, which is there now. 1997 Kyoto Protocol, we, all the everybody decided to phase this out. Now, 2020 onwards, India is also not supposed to produce any equipment which will use chlorofluorocarbons. So it took 60 years or 70 years for us to find it out. When asbestos came, people thought that our roofing problem is solved. It was called as a wonderful building material. That is the word which used. It was used extensively in build schools and there's not only in India, it was used extensively in Africa, Europe and even US. But took again to decades for us to find out that asbestos causes cancer. Formaldehyde. It is there in our plywoods. It is there in our many of the melamine. So things have changed. We find it out much, much later. I'm just given only a small list. We look at many of the chemicals used for pest control. Many of the chemicals used as timber preservatives. Many of the paints which have been used. They are all dangerous. That could be, I was talking to one of my clients, is an oncology surgeon. He said, the cancer is very much on the increase. Every family has got a cancer patient now. And he said, foods and the environment is the reason for it. So do you want to give such a thing for the uh, future generation?
This is one of the questions. So we have to be very careful about the technology coming and fixing our solutions. Now use of concrete. In 1972, September, Architectural Review, Architectural Review is still considered to be one of the topmost architectural magazines in the world. A lot of the thought process come. They carried out an article with title called a flat roof scandal. The problem is that they studied concrete buildings and they found that one third of the concrete buildings are leaking. Concrete roof has a leaky, leaking issue. It's not waterproof, it is not there. When I studied in Civil Engineering in 1979, Jairam Sar, who was the HOD when I joined, told us that you are going to build buildings which are going to last for 750 years. You are going to build buildings with concrete. This is what we told on the first day. And I still remember another story is that if an engineer, if a doctor makes a mistake, it will be over with the patient. If an advocate makes a mistake, it will be over with the case. But if an engineer makes a mistake, then it will be for everybody to see. So if you look at that point of view, now I go to various classes and sessions and ask now how long will the concrete proofs last? 75 is the maximum number people will see. If we are building buildings which last 75 years, why do we want to teach it? We know very well that our traditional buildings and traditional technology, the buildings will last for 200 years or 300 years, with our 400 years. Why do we want to teach children about this concrete technology? High energy intensity. It's thermally uncomfortable. Many of the concrete houses are like ovens. My father built a house in the 19... 60s. I had to put metal sheets on top, false roof on top because it leaks after some time. It is so hot to overcome it and also difficult to disassemble. Now the thing is designed for disassembly. Sustainable architecture, one of the latest concepts, whatever you do should be reversible. You should be able to dismantle it and reuse it. The problem with concrete, if you have to dismantle it, it can be used only to fill in low-lying areas. So uh, why are we trying to use such an extensive use of concrete in such a case? Can we limit the use of concrete? And you can see the problem. A lot of the consultations I get is how to repair leakage in concrete roofs or dampness in concrete slabs or rising dampness, similar things, which are there, very much there in new buildings as well. So, I won't say it's the concrete which is to be blamed, but concrete, the way the concrete is used, the concrete has to expand and contract every day, because that's what we studied in physics, coefficient of thermal expansion, one degree rise in temperature means it has to expand. So, in the daytime and nighttime, 15 degree difference in temperature means every day it's expanding and contracting. So, even the cement plaster is not durable. All these things is going to have a problem. This is a building which is next to my house. This building has been built 20 years ago. But what you can see, the entire plaster has cracked, my minor cracks. And you can see this part which is inside. That is not cracked. It's the same mason, same mix, but the details have gone wrong. But this is a compound wall in my house with a small coping. This is also done with cement plaster, perfectly durable, nothing much of this. That three inches on is protection. There are certain details which we are used in our traditional buildings. There are certain things which will increase the life of a building, the durability of a building. Something which we aim in the name of the, the typical called modern architecture. So this is a lime plaster in my building. I um, mean, uh, very little overhang. We inserted a ventilator. Nothing has happened to the lime plaster which has been applied in 1920s. This building is more than 100 years old. But still the lime plaster is in good condition. That is why the, it's very well known, scientifically proven, that the lime plaster is much more durable than this thing. The quality of construction has come down in our buildings. The problem in quality of construction coming, if our, if our buildings don't last the way it's supposed to last, then it affects the sustainability. What sustainability are we talking about that our buildings will last only for 25 years or 30 years or 40 years or even 50 years? In a study done by World Bank, they said, said that we will never be able to solve the housing problem unless we buildings which are lasting for at least 75 years. 
In Tamil Nadu, I mean, its situation will not be very different in many other parts of India. In Chennai city, the slum clearance board buildings which have been built in the late 70s and 80s are being demolished and new buildings are being coming up. Buildings have lasted only for 30, 35 years. What is the problem? So we have to look at the durability of the buildings. We have to construct buildings which have a good durability. If you ask me which is the biggest problem construction industry is facing today, I will say it is mainly the, the quality of construction. When I started my practice in 1984-85, we never used to think about waterproofing. Now waterproofing has become the norm. So where is this yield? Are our buildings durable? And this is one, one very, very important point. I have made some work on the disasters because I have done work in few disasters. When the Kerala floods came, I wrote something which was published by Kerala government as a book. But I will just tell one or two points where even after writing the book or writing in many forums I pointed out, still we are going. Because we used to say in the olden days, Kerala will become a desert if we don't control deforestation. But now it is the other way around. Kerala will become a lake. Kerala will never become a desert, a desert of this thing. Disasters are some, something which will come in once in a while, completely wrong. I wrote this book and you can see the number of disasters have been on the increase. Climate change is happening, global warming is happening. So in future, more cyclones, more earthquakes, more hurricanes, everything will be on the increase. And don't think it is going to come once in 10 years or 20 years. If the 2018 floods has come, the chances of it, even if chances of it coming, even if it is a 500 year event or 100 year event, 1924 we had and 2018 we had, the chances of it coming in the next 10 years is 10% using the probability theory. And we saw 2018, I, I listened to one of the ministers said that disasters will come once in a while. Now the next disaster will come after 100 years. But that is not the case and we faced it and that is what we realized. And there is also thing that we have to get prepared for a disaster. What relief work which is taken once the disaster comes is not what I am talking about. We have to plan for future floods or future any of the disasters, which unfortunately we are not done. Global warming has become a reality. We cannot escape like the way the NOVA arc way it is not possible we will never be able to go back and become an amphibian or any of the consequences now this is the situation in 2018 floods what has happened is that many of the areas which has never got flooded got 2018 flood level was higher why the damage became more the reason is we have started building in flood plain. so the water will enter this area and this is a cross section of a river for example Water will enter this area only if the water overflows and water never used to overflow. But in 2018 overflow, many of the other areas were flooded. That is why Rami, Patanandaka, Changanu, the entire area was flooded. Now what people do is, I mean if this is the level, so I am building a house, I just fill up this area. So 2018 flood, this is the level which water rose. Because of my feeling, water will overflow on the other bank. Because it's the same amount of water which is going to come. We are doing indiscriminate feeling in many other areas. The problem is becoming more and more serious. And this is something which is to be addressed by the professionals. We should not be doing. We should make a plan for the entire area. And for facing the disaster in 2050, we should plan now. I visited uh, Netherlands in 10 years ago, 2011 I visited. I could find how they are. 40% of Netherlands is below sea level. They are building huge dikes. They are expecting 1 meter sea level rise in 100 by 2100. What they are doing, their city should not, will not get flooded with 4 meter rise of water, sea level rise. They are building new dikes, they are building highways on top of it. I mean, it's not something which we can do when the disaster comes or two years before that. We have to plan for it. And it's very, very important. This is an article which came in uh, time. 
Western architecture is making India's heat waves worse. Our situation will be much, much worse because this problem is going to get aggravated. The flood level is going to be more serious because once the sea level rise, our rivers will not empty into the sea properly. I mean, uh, so this Times correspondent from London called me and uh, took an interview with me. We follow the Western models. We have to develop indigenous solutions using the science and technology to this. I've been working on the disaster issue, climate change issue for the last more than two decades or two, three decades. I just thought that the problem, I will never have to see the problem. My children will have to face this problem. That is what I expected. But now I'm worried that I have to see these problems. The problems are becoming much earlier than I anticipated. And this is a problem which affects the entire world. And our building industry is something which is a major contributor for uh, causing these issues. Very, very important. Our planet is very fragile. Our actions and the tools we use is leading to the climate change and environment. It's very, very important that we look at sustainable architecture. It's very, very important that we conserve our buildings. It's very, very important that we make minimum impact on the environment. And that is the kind of practice that it might not be 100% true, but for the last two, three decades, starting from where Laurie Baker has started, I've just tried to take it in my own way with my limited knowledge. I'm trying to continue that tradition. We have to learn from the mistakes which the West has committed. We are building flyovers. The West has stopped building flyovers three decades ago. We are, I mean, building malls. 25% of the malls in the US are closed. 22% of the malls are closed even before the corona. And the retail industry has been very badly affected by the corona lockdown and the way the online business has picked up. They say another 15% malls will be closed in the next year three or four years and we have to protect the nature and exploiting the nature. We think that exploiting the nature is our right and we might think that with science and technology we have conquered nature but nature will give it back to us. There is a way which we have to deal with nature and that is what the nature is giving us in the name of the climate change and global warming. Thanks a lot.